Today, if you need a Holy Bible, please put your hand up. At the all show, we have one hand up. That needs a Bible up from two, three hands. Or is it two hands? Amen. Praise the Lord. The sermon is going to come from the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 16. The theme is, why do the righteous suffer? Why do the righteous suffer? Is God unfair? That is the theme. Shall we please stand? Every one of us, as I call on the man of God, Dr. Reverend Dr. Theophilus Limbo. Let us give him Thank you, Lord, for our life. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the, the courage, for giving us the zeal to be able to come here to learn your words, your Lord. Father Almighty, we submit ourselves to you. We beg you, Father Almighty, that your words with which you're going to feed us this morning sanctify it, O Lord. Consecrate the hearts that will hear the words, O Lord. I know the tongue that will deliver it, O Lord. Without you, we can do not. Speak through your servant, Father Almighty. And let your words have photograph in our hearts. That from today, never let our lives be the same again. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. <coughs> the text of our Bible reading this morning. We'll be coming from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. And I'll be reading from the NIV version. I hope you follow me. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preachings we are not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith will not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Amen. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in our misery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through this spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man who is in him? Amen. Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, Amen. so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, 
combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritually appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. God bless his holy word. Amen. Our theme this morning is why do the righteous suffer? Is God unfair? Why do the righteous suffer? Is God unfair? And these are the questions which have often baffled many believers and non-believers, and especially Christians, why they have to undergo trials, tribulations, sufferings, and injustice in this world, while the wicked do seem to have relative, relative peace in this world. For some of us, that have had the opportunity to read and learn about the life and trials of a man called Job in the Bible. I am sure some of us would have asked, why did God have to allow Satan to inflict such tragic experiences on such a man that the Bible said was perfect and righteous before God and man? As we read in Job 1, 1 to 3, it says this about this man. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels, and five hundred yoke of oxen, and five hundred she asses, and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. There was no other human being in the Bible that was given such exalted credential of moral virtue, and yet he was not spared the trials of Satan. Before we can fully understand the mundane myth lessons that the book of Job was trying to teach us, which will illuminate the darkness of our mind, we have to digress a little into the events that led to the Job being picked up for trial by Satan. It is that we shall be able to either answer or understand the following baffling questions. One, why do the righteous suffer? Two, is God on fear? Three, is anyone free from Satan's temptations and attacks? Four, does Satan have to get permission from God before he can attack us? And five, why does God allow Satan to tempt and attack us? The book of Job helps us to understand the following. Satan cannot bring financial or physical destruction upon us unless it is by God's permission. God has power over what Satan can do and cannot do. It is beyond our human ability to understand the whys behind all the suffering in this world. The wicked will receive their just dues. We cannot always blame suffering and sin on our lifestyles. Suffering may sometimes be allowed in our lives to purify us, to test us, to teach us, or to strengthen the soul. God remains enough. He deserves and requests our love and praise in all circumstances of life. In any position we find ourselves, let us praise God. For the benefit of those of us who have never heard about the man called Job in the Bible, since you have refused to come to Bible study on Wednesday and enrich your knowledge in the teachings of Christ Jesus, we shall briefly have to touch the book of Job. The book was written during the time of either Moses or Solomon to teach humanity about our relationship with God, about the vanities of all things and omnipotence of God our Creator, Job was a perfect and righteous man before God and man, and was blessed with seven sons and three daughters, lots of possessions and treasures, and God blessed the works of his hand, and most of all, 
Job was under the protection of God. Amen. To be under the protection of God, like Job, it means everything that you can ever imagine, which we shall further discuss. Satan, if you must know, used to roam about in the world like a lion, roaming the grasslands and wilderness in search of prey to the ball, searching for idle hands and weak-minded people of little faith to lure away from the gate of heaven. God asked Satan in Job 1, 7 to 8, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschewed evil. Satan, of course, had seen Job and his children on many occasions and must have envied them and tried to touch them, but could not even get near them because of what? Satan answered God in verse 9 and 11. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, that God, or that Job fear God for nothing? Has not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he had on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. He said, God, put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will cross thee to thy face. If Satan could throw such a challenge to God, does it not surprise you that he could stand before Jesus in the wilderness and tempted him three times despite the fact that he knew that Jesus is Lord and Son of the living God? Amen. Who else is too just? Who else is too righteous? And who else is too perfect from Satan? Hmm. Or for God to put his faith and trust on trial? We will not say that Satan challenged God. Because who is he to challenge his creator? Amen. But teased God in verse 11. What did Satan say? He said, God, he said, put forth thy hand now and touch all that he had, and he will cause thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he had is in thy power. I give you everything that he has, including his body, but do not touch his soul. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, why has Satan not been able to attack Job since all those days? And it's simply because of the hedge that God had around Job and all his household. And unless you understand what we mean by this hedge, you will not understand or appreciate the magnitude of the protection you will have whenever you pray to be covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. What does Satan mean when he said, Has thou not made a hedge about him? What is a hedge? The hedge is a fence. If you go about in America, you see people living in houses. This house is separated from this house by a partition. Mm -hmm. And that is what in ancient day we call hedge, or fence, or wall. And when God now make a fence around you, Hallelujah. can Satan reach you? No. This is not possible. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So the hedge is a fence, a wall of protection around him. He had. And God encompassed him about with this wall as with a shield, a head which could not be broken down by men or devil. He surrounded him with his almighty power that none could hurt him. He guided him by his providence. He caused his angels to encamp about him. Yea, he himself was a wall of fire around him. The Tango interprets it, the word of God. So thick was the head, so strong the fence, that Satan could not even find the least God, to get in at to do him any injury to his body or to his mind without the divine permission. Amen. 
So whenever we pray for the church, we pray also for the head. Yes. Without the head, we are porous. And when we have a gap, Satan can enter. Mm. So it's very, very important that we pray for that God to surround us with his head. Amen. 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 And now, Satan could not find rest. He could not find the least gap to enter, to do any injury to him. And he envied him. And he was vexed and maliciously suggest that this was the motive of Job's fear of the Lord. And indeed, it was an obligation upon him to fear him anyway, but not the sole cause of it. What we are trying to say, Satan was trying to tell God that it's because of what you've given to him that he's fearing you. Mm -hmm. If you can fear God when you are in a poor state, Hallelujah. when God blesses you and becomes rich, you will still fear God. Hallelujah. Because you are not fearing God because of what he's going to take away from you. Yeah. Because you know that he makes everything. And you can take them at any time. Anyway. So you will fear him. Amen. But Job was trying to instigate God, was trying to infuriate God that it's because you have given him this. What an indictment. And what a challenge to God when Satan boasts before God that Job will deny God when he loses all the grace and protection. The pertinent question this morning is. Can God also have the same confidence in you and me today? If Satan should go and seek permission from God to put our faith and trust in God to test, Satan went and inflicted every kind of tragedy, pain, abuses on the flesh and mind of Job. And his friends also came and made demoralizing statements while trying to console Job that it was because he must have sinned against God which God did not reveal to him, except his fourth friend, Elihu, who advocated for God and Job. Job, within one week, lost his ten children. He lost all his servants. He lost all his flock of sheep and animals. And his big mansion, he lost everything. And as if that was not bad enough, Satan attacked his flesh with boils and rashes, that he could no longer wear those fine robes of a rich man, but had to go naked, sitting outside, inside ashes, and using broken out and wear to scratch his body. He was alone, awaiting death, but death refused to come and relieve him of his pain. His wife advised him to deny this young God and either live or die. But he would not deny God. But he said, The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Finally, in desperation, Job questions God himself and learned valuable lessons about the sovereignty of God and his need to totally trust in the Lord. Job was then restored to health, happiness, and prosperity beyond his earlier state. If we now imagine ourselves sitting down inside ashes in total state of distress and sadness like Job, despised by everybody except our close friends who came to console and comfort us, what will be going on in our brain and mind? Just let us put ourselves in this despicable situation. As Job was pondering the cause of his misery, three questions came to his, to his mind, all of which are answered in our Lord Jesus Christ. These questions occur in chapter 14. First in verse 4, Job asked, Who can bring what is pure from the impure? Who can bring what is pure from the impure? Certainly no one. Job's question came from a hand that recognizes it cannot possibly please God or become justified in his heart. Amen. God is holy. We are not. Therefore, a great gulf exists between man and God Amen. caused by sin. But the answer to Job's anguished question is found in Jesus Christ. He has paid the penalty for our sin. 
and has exchanged it for his righteousness, thereby making us acceptable in God's sight. Amen. And the Bible backs it up in Hebrews 10, 14. It says, by, for by one suffering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Mm -hmm. And then also in Colossians 1, 21 to 23, it says, and you that were sometimes alienated and the enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now have he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and un Reprobable in his sight, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, we are of I, Paul, I am the their minister. And then also in 2 Corinthians 5 17 to 18, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. And all things are of God. Amen. Who are reconciled unto himself by Jesus Christ. Amen. And have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Your second question. But man dies and lies prostrate. Man expires. And where is he? In verse 14. It's another question about eternity and life and death that is answered only in Christ. With Christ, the answer to where is he is eternal life in heaven. Without Christ, the answer is eternity in outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. As the Bible said in Matthew 25, 30, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and grasping of teeth. Amen. And Job's third question was found also in 14. If a man dies, we are, will he live again? If a man dies, will he live again? Once again? The answer is found in Christ. We do indeed live again if we are in him. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, Amen. then the saying that is written will come true. And what is that? Death has swallowed up in victory. We are all death, it's your victory. We are all death, it's your sting. Jesus is raising. Hallelujah! And that is 1 Corinthians 15, 54, 55. What lessons do we really learn from the experience of Job? Sometimes we are tempted or quick to judge and condemn others for what we consider ungodly without bothering to find out the truth, why and how. Jesus knew this fact about us and he too manifested in complete human flesh in order to share the experience of how we see things from our own human senses. And that was why he said in Matthew 7, 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. To judge here does not exactly mean to pronounce condemnatory judgment, nor does it refer to simple judging at all, whether favorable or reverse. The context makes it clear that the thing here condemned is that disposition to look unfavorably on the character and action of others, which lead invariably to the pronouncing of rash, unjust, and unlovely judgment upon them. No doubt, it is the judgment so pronounced which are here spoken of. But what our Lord aims at is the spirit out of which they spring. Provided we eschew this unlovely spirit, we are not only warranted to sit in judgment upon the brother's character and action, but in the exercise of a necessary discrimination are often constrained to do so for our own guidance. It is the violation of the law of love involved 
in the exercise of a censorious disposition which alone is here condemned. And the argument against it, that ye be not judged, confirm this, that your own character and actions be not used against you with the like severity that is at the great day. Hallelujah. For which judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye met, whatever standard of judgment ye apply to others, it shall be measured to you again. Thank you. Again, this proverbial maxim is used by our Lord in other connections, as in Mark 4.24, and with a slightly different application in Luke 6.38, as a great principle in the divine administration. Unkind judgment of others will be judicially returned upon ourselves in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Amen. But as in many other cases under the divine administration, such harsh judgment gets self-punished even here. And this is what some call the law of retributive justice, or the law of karma, or the law of cause and effect. Amen. For people shrink from contact with those who systematically deal out rash judgment upon others. Naturally concluding that they themselves may be the next victims and feel impaired in self-defense when exposed to it to roll back upon the assailant his own census. How does the account of Job life bear relevance to our daily life today? In our relationship with God, who sees your heart because he moved you while you were yet in your mother's womb. Amen. And has decided your destiny even before you were born. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. He knows how far and how close you are to him. Yes. The book of Job reminds us that there is a cosmic conflict going on behind the scenes that we usually know nothing about. Often we wonder why God allows something and we question or doubt God's goodness without seeing the full picture. Mm -hmm. The book of Job teaches us to trust God under all circumstances. Mm -hmm. We must trust God, not only when we do not understand, but because we do not understand. Mm -hmm. The psalmist tells us, as for God, his ways is perfect. Amen. That is Psalm 1830. Amen. If God's ways are perfect, then we can trust that whatever he does and whatever he allows is also perfect. Amen. And this may not seem possible to us, but our minds are not God's mind. Yeah. It is true that we can't expect to understand his mind perfectly. And he reminds us, unquote, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Yeah. Neither are your ways my ways, yes. said the Lord. Yes. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, yes. so are my ways higher than your ways, yes. and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. As we saw in Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. Nevertheless, our responsibility to God is to obey Him, Amen. to trust Him, Amen. and to submit to His will, Amen. whether we understand it or not. We now come to the conclusion of our message today, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry if I have not been 